Does everybody can look this picture? This is one of the most famous paintings in the world. It's called Composition Number no. 8. It's in the Solomon Guggenheim Museum of New York, and it's painted almost 100 years ago from Vasily Kandinsky. What do we see if we're trying to describe it, if we were trying to explain it to a person? We see circles, we see lines, we see something that looks like it's taken from some book of projective geometry. Um, somebody tried to play some chess right there, grids, things that overlap with each other, but recognizable. But on the other hand, they are separate from each other, and they do make a sense, they do have an aesthetic value, they do have an integrity. So, how does that connect us to AI and the medical domain? This is another image. This is an image of a histopathological cancer part, which was cut off from a person. And we do recognize in this image parts that we see in our everyday life. We can see that we have components, we have segments that we can recognize. We can think that we can see groups in there. We think that, okay, there's some glue that connects everything. It's not all symmetrical, but it has integrity. It has some kind of information to show to us. And this is how we get from art to medicine through AI. I'm Anna Soranti. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Interactive Systems and Data Science at the Graz University of Technology. And I'm currently employed by the Institute of Medical Informatics, Statistics and Documentation at the Medical University of Graz. And today, I will talk about one important challenge at this year's Neurips 2018 about visual concept learning through a framework that was programmed in the Medical University of Graz, which is called Kandinsky Patterns. So Vasily Kandinsky himself stated that everything starts from a dot. This is how he started painting, probably. For us, everything starts from medical images. And since we need to t think about privacy, you can click on this um, link if you want to see a lot of medical images as the one that I showed you before, from different patients and in different groupings. And need to think of that the Medical University of Graz produces every day 14 terabytes of data that are cleaned up by humans. Humans do the data pre-processing step there. And we have one of the most important and biggest scanners of the world. So how do we get from aesthetics to the interpretation of medical images? What do we do when we want to interpret a medical image? What do doctors do? What do the people that have the domain knowledge do? They talk about morphology, they talk about geometric structure, they talk about how cells are gathered in relation to others. They talk about organization and they think they see groups. They perceive cells in groups. In other words, they talk about architecture. And this is one of the possibilities that they can express those things. Apart from the dialogue that they have with the patient, there has to be a textual form, always. They have to explain why they took a decision, and this is how they build trust with the patients. And it's very important to think that each doctor does it in its own or her own way. So there's a lot of different text types for the same problem, for the same patient. Now, what do we see here? On the left side, there is this gigapixel image that I talked before, and it is sliced into grids. And it's passed through a neural network. And on the right side, we see a heat map that was produced in one of the possibilities of 
heat mapping that there exists out there. A lot of software, different types. And we see that particular cells that are in red were very important to identify why there was a decision about a cancer type or having cancer or not having cancer. And other parts were not that important, denoted with blue. But you don't go with this at home. You don't go to the doctor and get this heat map back. You need something more. Because a diagnosis is an explanation in text form. It's not just the visual or the, uh, uh, the listing of the characteristics of the decision. You need to have explanation. And in the European Union, since May of 2018, there is the GDPR, which regulates a lot of stuff that have to do with data and also lots of things about privacy. But there's also compliance to legislation, and it's called right for explanation. We need to enable retraceability, reinactivity, to retain human reliability, and foster trust and acceptance. And to always remember that the medical report is legally binding because it contains text, because it contains textual explanation. The image, the heat map, is not enough. But machine learning has evolved, AI application have evolved, and we can go from images to text. It's quite easy. This is the work of Andre Carpathy and Fei Fei Li. So we can go from images that are described by text, and we can create captions that describe them. Of course, there will always be mistakes because all those um, machine learning algorithms don't perform 100%, and one tends to concentrate on that. But this would be catastrophical if it doesn't have a good performance in the medical domain. So let's go back. Let's forget the text about uh, for a while, and let's go to the image processing part. We have image processing applications with AI right now that are overwhelming and everywhere. We can do classification, we can do segmentation, we can do object detection, we can work with video images, you name it. But all those algorithms existed in a previous form from 1999. Segmentation was there in the medical images for years now. So it isn't quite new. And one can separate a lot of classes from each other. But think about this data set that you're seeing here. The upper row contains images of one particular class. And the second row contains images of the opposite class, the true and the false. Can you separate those? Of course, you can separate cars from dogs and dogs from cats. But can you separate those two data sets, those two uh, samples. Uh, a person needs to think about this a little bit, needs to look at the images, needs to start comparing, needs to think about, OK, how many colors do I have there, how many different shapes. But you cannot get away with local features because they're quite similar in both of your data sets. It is very important that you as a human need to think, you need to compare, and you need to go and think about concepts. If you spend some time, which is different for every person, you will see that um, the upper line contains images that were generated by the concept of addition. So the number of yellow circles and the number of yellow, oh, sorry, blue circles equal the number of red circles. And the, uh, all the samples that were in, in the second row were not generated by this concept. So let's go to the elephant in the room, the ground truth. Who created those images? Who thought about the concept that was transformed to requirements and was transformed to code to create those two data sets? In our case, in medicine, Ground truth is only approximated 
by a doctor that has spent years in its education and experimentation and l have looked a lot of patients to make sure what is the diagnosis. And it's never 100% sure. Different doctors will do completely different diagnoses for the same person. And often there's a dialogue with the patient. Sorry. Okay. So let's start with something simple. Let's start with an uh, understandable visual concept of vertical symmetry. Now, all the images that you see have, have ge are been generated by the same process, right? The left side is same as the right side. There's a reflection. And we can go, typically, and pass through symmetrical from non-symmetrical images from neural networks. And we can use tools like Investigate that shows us what was the most relevant parts of the image that helped us to do this classification between symmetric and non-symmetric images. And one typical example of a heat map would look like this. On the left side, we have a symmetrical image. On the right side, we have a non-symmetrical image. And what do we see? Now, this algorithm needs to do some basic object detection because the red parts that are highlighted are around the object. The background doesn't play a role. But there's something to be said about where those important places are. In the left side, they are symmetric. On the other right part, they are not. But this is not something that you get it from the heat map. If you don't know about symmetry, you don't know your data sets, one has to talk about this to you. If you don't know that your classifier was on uh, a journey to discriminate between symmetric and non-symmetric, you would just see the heat map and say, OK, those two uh, groups of objects are important for my diagnosis and not the symmetry between them. And one can go and try some other interpretable model that's acceptable, like uh, decision trees or Bayesian networks. And one doesn't so much think about explainability in those terms because it's more or less given, regardless of how big the rules of a decision tree is or regardless of how big a Bayesian network is and regardless of how difficult it is to even test if the inference algorithm, in this case, expectation, on expe expectation maximization that learns the parameters was uh, for the correctness of the uh, learned result. So what is our approach in the Medical University of Graz? And how did we get to be one of the challenges of NOIRIPS of 2019? First of all, we have a repository that everyone can look at to prepare for the challenge. And we do have a lot of other projects there that have to do with privacy and that have also to do with visualization. And let's start with something simple, a Kadinsky figure, which is a simple figure containing three types of shapes, having three types of colors, and can be positioned in the middle of the figure so that you don't have crop images or overlapping shapes. It's easy, it's understandable, and it's perceivable as it is. And this is one of the challenges. You see in the front, in the, in the upper row, you see the, all the images that belong to a specific concept that is thought by the creator of the challenge. In the second row, you see samples of images that follow the opposite concept. And one of the tasks is to discriminate between those two. But a hint is in the third class, which is called counterfactuals. All those images in the third row are created by a small change in the concept of the first row. And they might look a lot 
like they're following the concept of the front row, but they don't. And they will provide one of the most important hints for you for the challenge. So what do we expect as a result of the challenge? Who is going to who gonna win the challenge in the end? Now, if somebody can separate true from false or true from counterfactual and can discriminate between those pairs, then yes, he can pass the challenge. But even more and even better would be if we had a textual explanation about why is, are those um, data sets discriminated from each other. And to solve the challenge and to be explainable in the medical domain, one needs, to, one needs to think, how do humans explain? Humans use concepts. Humans use descriptions, textual descriptions that contain shapes, colors, uh, amounts of data, and some kind of relations from left position to right. And also, what we like to bring into the picture uh, because there are a lot of benchmarks out there, like many people know the Clever dataset. Uh, Francois Cholet also presented the famous paper um, this month, The Measure of Intelligence, and he has his own measure of intelligence and his own IQ test. Um, we also need to bring in the idea of Gestalt, which you see in the second row, and it's part of the challenge of the Neurips. It will be very important for AI algorithms of the future to understand between things that are perceived as one particular entity, although they are composed by other many small entities that are recognizable in the data set. So let's do that in the traditional way as humans. Let's go through. We have 16 images that follow the same concept. And there are four images on the bottom that don't follow the concept. One could go and say, OK, we have four objects, but you know, on the bottom we see also four objects, so this is not the case. All the images in the upper set are parts that are created by the concept that they should follow all the same shape, all the time triangles, all the time rectangles, and the number doesn't play a role, the color doesn't play a role, and this would be great if it was in a textual explanation. And there are a lot of different interpretations that one could give for a particular Kandinsky pattern, but of course, one needs to also be um, attentive and not miss it, basically, to win the challenge. So. For that, we created a booklet that people can fill out, but also we have an online uh, website where you can go and play around and try to prepare yourself for the challenge and try to use your own textual explanation to propose solutions and propose um, words and descriptions of what you see. And you can also use the code to generate code and your own patterns. You can generate own images, and one of those could be the Mickey Mouse pattern. Um, create your own gestalts and see if your AI algorithms are in position to separate images that look very similar to each other. So challenge your AI algorithms. Define your own ground truth and use it. Define new interesting patterns yourself and you can generate as much images as necessary. And think of how your AI algorithms will perform if you don't have that many images in your disposition. You can reproduce the results of your tried hypothesis. The reason that this was created is that we need to compare the ground truth with the textual explanation all the time. And we need to program in a controlled exploration environment. So hints for the challenge, relationship between objects are important, but the architecture is more important. There are a lot of papers right now that try to, with the use of text, to find out the relationship between objects positioned in a 3D space. We are not going in that direction that we need to find relationship of pairs of objects. 
we are trying to make statements about the whole architecture and the whole image. It will be helpful for you if you describe your, the underlying generating concept in textual form. And of course, deal with data that appear not to follow the rules. Thank you very much, and it's time for questions. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. So can we switch to the Slido screen? And if you haven't already, please go into slido.com, hashtag WAD2019, and ask some questions. OK, and also, if you don't have any questions yourself, mm -hmm. you can go in and upvote some questions so that you, they really get answered. OK, so let's do the first question. How better does AI-based image segmentation in contrast to the classical mathematical-based approaches function? Um, this is a very, very general question. And if you're asking about our particular domain, um, I can assure you that the classical image segmentation can do already a lot for us. But this is also not something that we need to do now. We're not going into the direction that we will sit down and compare the old image segmentation with something that we can do with an RCNN. That is not our goal. We know that we can segment probably better with this new algorithm. But this is not the direction we want to go. We want to know the underlying concept. We want to know that if we don't segment, what is the concept? Interesting. Okay. okay. All right. So the next question is, is there a way to measure explanation quality? Have you assessed your results using this measure? There are two things that I can say about this question. First of all, that explanation quality for us is uh, something that has to be near the ground truth. Mm. If we define it. But if we say that, uh, can I see again the have results? Okay. Yeah. Um, but this is also something that's also very relative because again, we don't, s we cannot say that we have the perfect ground truth unless we create it that way. And to see that the text that we're producing compared to this ground truth is um, has some overlap. And what we are trying to do is that our explanation is apart from being near to the ground truth, that it's not um, um, repeating itself, mm -hmm. that it's compact, that it doesn't have things um, that are um, überflüssig in German, that are, um, uh, are completely unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And the second thing that I would like to say is that there is something that's called causability. That means that we provide an explanation, but we also need to interact with the person in a sense of a dialogue. We cannot just go and say, oh, we provided an explanation, and just because it's near the ground truth that we define, or because an algorithm is so good that approximated the opinion of a medical expert, this is why it's good. Mm. We have to also interact with the person to see, did it understood the first sentence, and then adapt the second sentence, and then adapt the third sec sentence. So not, it's not one measure. Mm -hmm. OK. So next question. Did mm -hmm. you try to segment 3D data, MRT or CT? <laughs> this is something that I first asked when I went to the labs. No, we don't, because that's the way that uh, doctors work. Um, if this is one of the cancer um, parts, they cut it in slices. Mm -hmm. They need to clean it in slices. They need to paint it so those particular cells are highlighted, and then it's digitized. So they don't work in a 3D manner. They work seeing each part separately. And sometimes, even if they find something in the first light, they need to check them all. Hmm. But isn't it maybe so that they work in this way because it has been previously very difficult for a human to look at it from a 3D pr pr point of view? It might be. Mm -hmm. it in might that be. sense, that do you think that there is implications in the future for uh, machine learning to help it to assess 3D data? I think at the time, as I see the digital images, they are already really huge. And I think that's the... Uh, probably the underlying reason. I can't imagine this 
huge image that I have to scroll 10 times to really get to the lowest level for this to be in a 3D space mm -hmm. and then go really with image processing in it. I think it will be an explosion of resources if one mm -hmm. has to do it. Mm -hmm. OK. All right, next question. Can you please give an example for application of Kandinsky patterns to medical imaging? Uh, not at the time, but the one that I've showed you before with the symmetry is one starting point because the application of this Kandinsky pattern will create the text that we will afterwards apply to medical images that I've showed you before to find out symmetries and explain them in textual form. And we're not after only symmetry. We are all concepts that have to do with um, counting, mm -hmm. that have to do with gestalts, that have to do with groups. And this is something that we're starting right now in this PhD. Exciting. Yeah. OK, next question. In the case of text generation failure and misinformation, who is to blame for the failure legally? Well, since the text that we have already is made by doctors, so we can only learn from them. Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's true. That's true. OK, let's take two more questions. Mm -hmm. uh, how accurate is AI right now in positively identifying patterns? Positively identifying patterns. You mean the Kadinsky patterns or in general? Who asked this question? Anybody like to volunteer? Let's say Kandinsky patterns. They are, most of them, I mean, that I've seen right now, pretty good to separate. Um, I've already started with the simplest of them, but I think it will be more challenging if I see the results of the performances of the challenging Kandinsky patterns in the neurops. And how much is pretty good, can I ask? Well, it's... Um, Or do you want to ask? <laughs> no, it's, um, it depends on the measure that you're putting in. If mm -hmm. you want to measure accuracy, then I would say um, over 90%. But wow. if what I do is use mutual information, and it will be a little bit lower than 90%. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. OK, last question. Are Siamese neural networks with triplet loss similar to your approach? How do they differ? Uh, we haven't already. Uh, applied them, and we don't compare the features yet with CMS neural networks. Perfect. OK, so that was it for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I'm just going to go.